Hello YouTube, PD Grizz here. Today we are going to talk about the fascinating topic of the humble can opener. I know, isn't that exciting? So to discuss the can opener, we're going to have to briefly talk about the history of the can and how the can opener came about because it's key to why the can opener is the way it is. But anyway, let's get started. The, uh, the original cans started to come out around the 1790s. These cans were nothing like today. You know, some, they weren't even necessarily round or looked like they were today, but essentially they were made of cast iron, just like a wrought iron gate, uh, you know, wrought iron, not cast iron. And um, the thing about these cans was the recommended method for opening them was to use a hammer and a chisel. And uh, often people would take the, the cans to their local butcher shop and the butcher would open the cans for them because it was just so difficult to do. So the, the next evolution came in 1810 with the invention of the steel tinned cans. You know, we call them tin cans. Cans were never made of tin. They were coated with tin to stop the, uh, the food from, you know, getting flavor from the steel, from corroding the steel, etc. But anyway, this was invented by Philippe de Girard and Peter Durand patented it in 1810. Now, shortly thereafter in the 1850s, the, fir yeah, the uh, first, uh, you know, can openers would be invented. But up until then, basically, you still used a knife to open it. And then they started making short, blunt, stout blades dedicated just for opening them, which you'll see on many, you know, scout and camp knives, even up into the, you know, early 1920s and later. But in 1855, Robert Yeats, and then in 1858, Ezra Warner, both invented slightly different, but almost the same thing, lever opening, lever operating can openers that opened the side of the can, not the top as we do today. It opened the side around the top, which left a very sharp, jagged edge. And this can opener is what led to, you know, being modified to create this can opener, which we see on, you know, all kinds of knives from all kinds of makers, you know, particularly the Swiss Army knives, starting with the, uh, the first soldier's knives in 1891 and until much later. But this has uh, the owner's initials on it, F-E or P-E or something, but... It's a cool knife from 1937. But this can opener operated by going around the side of the can, not the top. That's what this lever was for. It just this acted as the point for you poke into the can like this and then claw, basically rip your way around it, leaving a very sharp edge on the can. The problem with this sharp edge was that a lot of people ended up getting cut. So much so that in the 1940s, the U.S. Army put out requests for knives with a safer can opener because during World War II, a number of soldiers were injured by stupid things opening cans. You know, you're fatigued, you're stressed out, you're in a freezing, soaking wet trench. You're, you know, it's the perfect storm for you to cut yourself using a sharp tool or a sharp can even. So in 1945, the Imperial Knife Company and uh, specifically, M.A. Mirando patented what we know today as the safety can opener. And the early ones actually said right on them, safety can opener. This is not that specific one, but it's basically the same thing. Any of these claw can openers like this are just variations on that original design. And, you know, they, they didn't enforce the patent. They let other manufacturers use it, you know, for the war effort. So that patent was basically meaningless. It quickly spread around the world and many knife makers covered that. And that brings us up to Victorinox. So in 1946, Victorinox adopted a similar style of can opener to this. And there were various variations of this. And this is really a variation of other claw, of other side openers that were existed in the 1800s. So the patent waters get murky because there's design patents and engineering patents. Design patents are more about the look of something, whereas an engineering patent is about the manufacturer and the, the operation of it. 
and one's more enforceable than the other. It, it gets very complicated, but for all intents and purposes, patents, gen, patents generally last 20 years. So in 1946, Victorinox starts using a claw type can opener. They switch from this type of can opener to this type of can opener. It didn't look exactly like this. Unfortunately, I don't yet own one that I can show an example of. They're, you know, they're hard as, uh, they're just, they're hard as, harder to find than hen's teeth. So this will have to be a stand-in for that. But either way, from 1946 to 1951, Victorinox used this type of claw can opener. Now, I'll get to the, the patenting deals with that and later, but, in 1951, they invented the can opener we know today. You know, the forward operating can opener with the screwdriver on the tip. And the old, these can openers worked by pulling it backwards around the can. This can opener works by going forwards in the can. That's why the blade's on the front and not on the, there's no hook to it. But, so we have that in 1951 patented by Victorinox. Wenger continued using the uh, Warner style side opening can opener up into the 60s. So they're not, this is around the 1960, 82 millimeter. Today we call it a Viking, but I'm not sure what they called it then. But when they released their Sportsman series, they adopted this can opener, which we call the uh, VZ dog leg, but it's actually a can opener patented by Max Wertel. I, I don't know, it's some weird name, hard to pronounce. I'm gonna call it Wertel, but uh, starts with an O. But regardless of that, prior to this, from 1959 to 63, they used a can opener that was almost the exact same thing, but had been patented by a, a gentleman by the name of Richard Eichenberger. And uh, so in 1963 or about, they started using this can opener, which they used up into the 70s. Now here's where the the the, uh, the the mythology of Victorinox can openers come in. This 1946 style can opener, you will often hear that Victorinox designed and patented this, but when they invented their 1951 style can opener, they gave their patents and tooling machining to Wenger so they could adopt this style can opener. The problem with that is Wenger didn't start using that can opener until of around 1973 to 1976, and Victorinox never patented this can opener. You'll never see a Victorinox can opener like this with a patent mark on it. If they had invented it, they would have put the patent mark on it as they did on any tool they invent, the only tool they actually invented, which was their can opener, which they patented until the patent expired in 1971. So they'd never patented or invented their claw type can opener. They just adopted the use of it. And they didn't give the, give their tooling to Wenger because as you know, their Wenger can opener looks nothing like that. So if it was the tooling, it would be the exact same thing. It, you know, so it makes no sense that people, you, you'll see it even on Sackwick, it gets printed that Victorinox patented this can opener and later gave the, uh, the, the right server to Wenger to use it. But that's just, there's just, it doesn't make any sense. There, you won't find any sources of this other than Sackwick referencing forums, referencing back to Sackwick. It's, it's a, a circular loop that doesn't prove anything. Unless it's actually printed somewhere in a publication or a periodical, it, it can't be cited as fact. But regardless of that, up into the 70s, Wenger used that dog leg can opener. And then around 1973 to 1976, they came out with their modern can opener. And uh, this is, uh, this can opener works great. It's much sharper. It's got like a chiseled grind to it. It's good for uh, cutting, you know, ripping packages open, doing all kinds of stuff. The one thing it lacks is you don't have any kind of Phillips screwdriver because the, the Victorinox can opener is a fantastic 2D Phillips. It fits many Phillips screws along with small flat heads. Many people don't, you know, want the back Phillips, but this works great on Phillips. Regardless of that, they use this style of can opener from 1960 or 1973 to 1976. Then in 1976, they took the same thing because what's better than me? If you want to make something better, just make it a little bigger. So they made it a little bigger. And this is the can opener that Wenger's use to this very day.
of course, they're out of business, but you know what I mean, until they went out of business in the 2000s. But anyway, you know, the point of this is to that, you know, when you're, there's a lot of things in the knife community that get repeated and they get repeated so many times that after a while, they just get accepted as fact. And unless there's actually a, a primary source for that information, you know, always be questionable about it. You know, you can use, it, use things as a guideline, but don't always assume that everything's correct just because you read it on the internet. You know, if there's anything you should know about the internet is that it's full of lies and people love to exploit those lies. So it's a silly thing to be upset about. I'm not upset about it. It's just uh, interesting to me when people just unquestionably accept, you know, things they read and hear. You know, obviously that has, you know, much bigger implications t in today's world. But, you know, it, you can start with something minor like this, like, you know, believing a myth about a can opener, and you can apply that to other areas of life where you just fall, you know, instantly believe anything you read without questioning it or doing any re re research into it yourself. So that's about it. I uh, hope this wasn't too long and too boring. But uh, one other thing I forgot to mention about the cans is that in the 1800s, they actually used uh, lead solder in the cans. They used that up until the 1900s. But the lead solder resulted in lots of people getting lead poisoning. Even the, uh, the infamous uh, Franklin Expedition of 1845 for the Northwest Passage, uh, a heavy contributing factor is now thought to be the fact that they were eating lead contaminated food from the recently invented tin cans that were using lead solder. And they actually found high lead contamination in bodies that they were dug up from, you know, that failed expedition, which lost two ships, the HMS Terror, the HMS Erebus, and all hands were lost in the Arctic. You know, that was, if you ever want to watch a cool movie, watch uh, the H, watch the movie The Terror. They, or I think it's called The Terror or HMS Terror, but it's a movie about that expedition and the horrors that went on. Absolutely terrible. But anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, like, subscribe, comment, all that obligatory YouTube crap, and I'll see you later. Bye.